Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Come on. Hey, man, I saw the, uh, I didn't get to watch the game, but I saw the score that the Lady Ducks beat the USA women's team. Man, that is awesome, right? My, uh, I, I, I don't get offended by what I say here, okay? Just <laughs> How many of you know, if somebody gives you a qualifier, you feel like I'm, now I'm going to be offended. No, I, my daughter came to me one time. She said, Dad, I want to I want to be a cheerleader, you know, for the Ducks. And I'm like, no, babe, you're going to play for the basketball team or the soccer team. Come on. I'm like, that's what we want you to do. But man, that's so amazing. Anybody go to that uh, here? Pretty cool. They said that they had not, the women's team, the USA team, it didn't, hadn't lost since 2006. And they hadn't lost to a college team since 1999. Wow. Pretty incredible. So come on. That's awesome. I think it goes right into um, the will of God for our city, uh, the will of God for our church. We're talking about bigger, right? God has bigger things like an Oregon Ducks men's football national championship run. Bigger, come on. Men's basketball, final four championships. I mean, it's just the prophetic destiny of God for our city. I tell people across the country, you know, there are a lot of deceived people in the United States of America. How many of you know? Particularly to the North wearing purple. Some it's very deceived just under shrouds of satanic darkness, uh, rooting for different teams, you know, and, and, and all these other teams, they have teams like tigers and bears and wildcats and ah, it's all power teams, but the Holy Spirit is gentle and uh, <laughs> humble. Some might say as humble as a simple waterfowl like a duck. <laughs> Not an evil, dangerous creature like a a husky, let's say, or a tiger, but a, but a simple duck, you know, and so we just wear that mantle as God's chosen team. Come on. Somebody has to do it. No, I'm just having fun. How many of you know a lot of hot air going on right now? Come on. And uh, don't get offended. It's okay. We gave you donuts and coffee, so just be at peace. Be warm, be filled. Uh, exciting day today. We're in a new series called Bigger. We're talking about elevating our perspective of God, seeing God for who He is and you know, it just changes everything in life when you get the right perspective of God. When you see God at the rightful place, recognizing his grace is bigger than my sin. His power is greater than whatever challenge or circumstance I'm going to face. And today we're talking about having bigger faith. Now, how many of you would say that faith is not something that, you know, most people don't just walk into the room on a Sunday and like, man, I need to share some of my faith with someone else because my faith is too big. In fact, I'm overflowing in faith. Faith typically is something that you could always do with more of. It's kind of like Chick-fil-A. You know what I mean? I, got to, I drove through Portland yesterday, and we stopped at Chick-fil-A, and I'm like, this is the glory of God in a chicken sandwich right here. Shekinah glory in a chicken sandwich. Come on, tell me about it. It's good. And I never leave Chick-fil-A and think, gosh, I've had my fill of waffle fries. And I always want more. Come on. Mas abundante. I want more. Uh, I want more of this. And uh, with faith, you know, it's never this place where your faith has now arrived. Hey, I've got big enough faith. I have big enough worship. I have big enough perspective of God. It's not really how it is. There, there's always another level. And uh, there's an old kind of preacher saying, they say, new levels, new devils. But in life, you know, when you hit thresholds, the thing is in your journey with God is you're never supposed to get to this place where it's sort of like safe and easy and, and dare I say, boring. Like we're supposed to get to this place where we're doing stuff and we're, we're being challenged, where we have to trust and lean into God because of the challenges that we're taking on. And so it's always about saying, God, I want to grow in my faith. And the beautiful thing is, no matter where your faith is right now, maybe right now your faith is like on, on empty uh, and like you're having to bum money off other people to fill the tank. Like, you know, it's so low. Or maybe it's really, really high, but no matter what, there's always more to have. And so we're talking about being people of big faith, really trusting in God. I like what Pastor Craig Grishel says. I'm going to share a lot of his thoughts today in this message. But he says this. He says, we are faith-filled, big-thinking, bet-the-farm risk-takers. We will never insult God with small thinking or safe living. This is the destiny. This is the identity that we as a church and, and for you in your life and your walk with God that we want to grab hold of. We are faith-filled, big-thinking, Bet the farm, risk takers, we will never insult God with small thinking or safe living. I like how he says that. Craig, I like the way you talk. You talk real pretty lack. It's nice. I like it. Jamie Buckingham said this, we need to attempt something so big that unless God intervenes, it's bound 
to fail. Come on. We, as people of faith, need to take on challenges, attempt something so big that unless God intervenes, it's bound to fail. This is what we're talking about today, and we're going to talk about it next week as well. Having bigger faith, allowing God to elevate us. This weekend, Bethany and I traveled to Cannon Beach, beautiful coast town up on the northern Oregon coast, and uh, they have a place there called Sleepy Monk. Anybody been to Sleepy Monk? It's a coffee shop, and they sell the world's best buttermilk bars. Buttermilk, they're like old-fashioned donuts. And I'm trying to, I've, I've been kind of, I've had a small problem with my weight just for like 20, 30 years, and I'm trying to, <laughs> just for a few years, but I'm trying to do better. So I, on Friday, I didn't get a donut, but Saturday, I was like, forget about it. I'm going to get the donut, dipping it in the coffee. Nothing to do with the message. Just wanted to let you know it's delicious. It's incredible. <laughs> so very, very good. We went to Cannon Beach for a pastoral uh, retreat and with a bunch of other pastors and leaders, and they asked me to share on creativity and uh, talk about how, as a church, we've done some creative outside-the-box things, and how do you catalyze that environment? And the Lord kind of spoke to me, shared with me this, this thought about what we call, what I call the gap, um, and, and it stands for this, grace activating pressure. And the principle of the gap is this, that in life we come to moments, we come to situations, for instance, Moses approaching the Red Sea with the people of Israel. If you're familiar with the book of Exodus, you're familiar with the Old Testament narrative, Moses leads Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, and then God is leading them, but they, he leads them right to the edge of the Red Sea, and here comes Pharaoh's army, and they're absolutely trapped, and there's this gap between where they are and where they're supposed to go. What God has for them is on the other side of the Red Sea, and their pathway to safety and escape is they're, they're, they're blocked by this, this Red Sea, by this, this body of water, and it's a gap, okay? They, they can't get across it. And, and this happens in life in a lot of different ways. Maybe you're facing a gap in your finances. Maybe you're facing a gap in your health. But, but there's this pressure, there's this problem. And, and what I would say is we tend to want to run away from these things, but as a person of faith, we should actually run to them and say, God, I dare you to show up in this moment, okay? You don't have to say it exactly like that. It might seem like not religious enough. You could say, Lord, I dare thee to show up in this moment. <laughs> but you get to this place, it's called the gap. It's grace activating pressure. And this is what it is, is it means that when we get to these challenges that are far beyond our own capacity, wisdom, or power to achieve or to get across, it's in those moments when God most often shows up in a miraculous, powerful way. And people of faith don't run from gaps, they run to them because we're always saying, God, we want to see what you're going to do when we can't do something. Come on, attempting something so big that it's bound to fail unless God intervenes. Or the alternative is you could play it safe, you could take no risks, and you could die of boredom. Okay, how many of you want door number two? You're like, Am I offending people today? I feel a little naughty today. I feel a little risky. I, you know what I mean? So if I, uh, forgive me in advance, but we're talking about elevating our perspective of God, elevating our faith, pursuing and leaning into those places of the gap, the grace activating pressure, like when, when we can't do something and God has to show up. Now, I want to tell you two stories from the scripture about two situations in which the scripture tells us that Jesus was amazed. Okay, the first one takes place in his hometown, and Jesus is teaching, and it says people were amazed at his teaching, but then we get this little verse here in Mark chapter 6, verse 5. It's, it's really interesting. It says, Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And I think, what a loser. He could only heal a few people. I'm like, that's amazing to me. But, but this is below the normal level that Jesus operates in. How many of you are kind of aware of this guy, Jesus? Like, he's pretty powerful. Um, he, he, we, we know from his, from accounts that he was a miracle worker. He was healing the sick. He was doing all kinds of stuff. So amazing stuff. So his disciples that are, that are recounting this, remembering this, that they, they're kind of like, well, this was different than Jesus. It was like Superman, but he wasn't leaping over buildings in a single bound. Like something was going on. Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. But listen to this. It says he was amazed. This is Jesus was amazed. His mind was blown at the people in his hometown at what? Their lack of faith. So let me just tell you right now, one of the things we can see is that there's, there's some kind of principle woven in here that God's power is in some way activated and or on the other side, limited by the presence or the absence of faith. And Jesus was amazed at how little these, these people believed and what it did to his capacity to do what God had called him to do and, who, and, and heal people and do miracles, okay? So Jesus was amazed. But then we go to the second story, 
And we get the other side of the coin. In Luke chapter 7, there's a centurion. It's a Roman military officer who was responsible for leading 100 people, and this 100 soldiers, and, and all the support staff and everything. This is a major military officer. The centurion uh, is a Roman, so he's really not part of the covenant community of Israel. But he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I have a servant who is sick. And I am a man who is in authority. I know there's people that say to me, go and I go, come and I come. And I'm also a man, in a, I have authority and I say to others, come and they come and go and they go. And he says, so if you'll just speak the word, Jesus, I know that my servant will be healed. And then we get Jesus' reaction in Luke chapter seven, verse nine. It says, when Jesus heard this, he was what? Say it with me, amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. So what amazes Jesus? Two sides of this coin. What amazes Jesus? He is amazed by a lack of faith, but he's also amazed by the presence of faith. And here's the question for us today as we interact with these verses and as we lean into this and look at becoming people of bigger faith. Are you amazing God for the right reason or the wrong one? Are you amazing Jesus for the right reason or the wrong one. Because here's the thing, again, we didn't walk in here going, man, I've just got too much faith and I could share some with other people. Like, that's not me. I'm coming in here today going, God, I, though I have walked with you for many years, though I have seen the moving of your hand in my life in so many different ways, I'm kind of like the, 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 the synagogue leader uh, in the scripture who said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Like for me, I always am looking for more faith. And so I'm asking myself this question. I'm not just preaching it to you. I'm preaching it to me. Am I amazing God by my faith in him or am I amazing him, or am I amazing him because of my lack of faith, lack of trust, lack of dependence on him? Where do we sort of fall on this spectrum? You know, when we talk about faith, faith can be used as a, as a category. So like when we talk about maybe are you a person of faith or, or a person who, who doesn't have faith, we, we use it more in a categorical sense. But faith the way we're using it today is more of a verb, more of an action sense of like, are we using faith and believing? But the way people tend to think of faith is kind of like delusional, uh, despite the evidence, I just do something or believe something no matter what. That's not really what it is. I would say biblical faith is really a, a, a relentless trust based in the character and, the, and the, the, the modeling that God has shown us of who he is throughout our life. So, for instance, if somebody were to come to me and say, man, Bethany was saying this about you and she was, you know, she was doing this and she, we saw her with some other dude, I'd be like, um, that doesn't sound anything like this beautiful, incredible woman that I've walked and journeyed with for 12 years, my wife. Um, if you told me that she went and spent $2,000 on um, obscure cactus, I would believe that. Where's my wife? <laughs> I can't find her. I don't know. I'm looking for, oh, there she is. But if somebody said she's running around, I'd be like, no, that's not her. Why? Because that's not her character. I know my wife. If my wife, if somebody came to her and said, hey, we saw Jake and he was doing this and this and this, Jake was skydiving, she'd be like, no, that's not him. <laughs> if they were like, we caught him at Guitar Center and he, he was buying preamps, then she'd be like, that's my husband, right? He's <laughs> buying more musical gear that he doesn't need that he'll never use. So with God, faith is not just, man, I just delusionally believe that anything in life, oh, God's going to, no. I, I, I'm recognizing that God has walked with me. I've walked with God and I have a dependence on him that even when the evidence or the circumstances don't align, I still trust him because of his character. Are you with me? And so what Jesus is amazed by here is he's done miracles. His character is known, but they're like, no, this is Jesus in our hometown. He's the son of uh, the carpenter and, 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 and they have no faith. And that blows his mind. And then also the presence of faith blows Jesus' mind. It amazes him. So where do we fall on this? So let's talk about how we kind of identify how big our faith is. One of the, the best thermometers of faith is our prayer life. Now, a lot of people hear the word prayer. They're like, I don't really understand prayer because it seems like religious or whatever. So I don't really do it. But here's what prayer is, everybody. It's, it's just communicating with God. It's talking to God. It's listening to God. That's what prayer is. So maybe you're like, well, I don't pray because I don't know the right words. Thee, thou, thine, thouest. You know, I don't add ith to everything at the end. Blesseth and Godeth, and I just come before you, if Lordeth, and I just seeketh your faitheth. You know, I mean, how do we how do we pray? It's not that. That's horrible. Don't do that. Um, 
You don't have to sound like a 12th century knight to pray. Uh, you, you can just talk to God. God, this is what I'm going through. Today, I, I, I mean, no, no mental images, but I went into the bathroom. Uh, I was done with the other stuff, but I went to the sink and I was like, Lord, I'm just, I'm a little bit tired. I wasn't feeling it in first service. God, could you just fill me with your Holy Spirit right now and help me because I have to go preach. That is a prayer. You with me? God, could you just give me a little extra mojo to finish this day? That's a prayer. God, my wife or my husband, they're doing this. This is how I'm feeling about it. My emotions are tied up. My kids are this. I, God, my coworker, could you just help me? Lord, I just, I worship you. I mean, these are, that's what prayer is, guys. Okay, it's communicating with God. But our prayer life, our communication with God is like a thermometer for where our faith is at. Let me ask you this question. If we looked back and, and we took the last calendar month, the month of October, and I told you, look, every prayer you prayed in the month of October has been answered by God. How cool would that be? Except for, for some of us, all that would have happened is we'd have had slightly better parking spaces. We'd have be two pounds lighter and our already perfectly clean, nice food is a little bit more blessed. Come on. <laughs> uh, I talked about it in first service that I, I come from a family of Pharisees and they're like, they're rigid about praying for their food right before you eat it. You know, and I, uh, Bethany and I, you know, we moved to Eugene and we just became totally loose in our, in our practice of Christianity. And so, you know, I go back to Medford with my family and I'm just teasing. I have the best family in the world, but I go back to Medford and we're sitting down and my mom makes some delicious Italian food. And so, man, I get that fork in the pasta and spin it around and I get the sauce and I'm just consuming it and loving life. And I'll look over at my dad and he's kind of there like, did you forget something? <laughs> I'm like, Parmesan? Was that what? <laughs> we didn't bless the food. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, St. Augustine. Okay, so, no, we didn't bless the food. And then I will always come back like a total uh, oldest son, uh, smart rear end, and say, well, Dad, you know, the Jewish people actually didn't bless their food ahead of time. They thanked God for it after they ate. And so you're the one who's theologically incorrect right here. No. <laughs> Goes over like, uh, yeah, really well. Anyways, how many of you know, like in our prayer life, like maybe all we do is bless our food and like the food is the blessing. Like that, if that's your, the totality of your prayer life, if you went back last month and God answered all your prayers, what, what, what I, and, I, and I'm just as guilty of this as you, like what I would hope is that if, if somebody said all your prayers from last month got answered, that all of a sudden like, homelessness and drug addiction and, and orphans and like people that need help in our city would like be encountering the grace and the love of God in a powerful way. And people would be activated and mobilized to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Like that's a good prayer. Come on. Like I, I would want that if, if you went back and my prayers have been answered that all of a sudden, like people by the hundreds and thousands are streaming into churches all across the city to give their life to Jesus. Come on. That, that unity would begin to come together, that we wouldn't care so much who you voted for. We would join together and say, this is all, all of our country. And we all want to make it better together. So let's stop ripping each other's heads off. Like, what if we prayed prayers like that? But here's the thing. We clap, but what did you pray for last month? He's a little, he's eating red meat again, I can tell. Just seems angry. No, guys, it's about our faith. What, how big is our faith? Are we blowing Jesus' mind because we're saying, God, I am crying out for you to do the things that only you can do. And God, we're trying to do stuff in our community that really is not going to change unless you show up in a powerful way. And our prayer shows where our faith level's at. So just rate, rate yourself internally. Don't rate your neighbor, rate yourself, right? Scale of one to 10, if Jesus is 10 and, you know, some, somebody else is one, I won't give any names or anything, but where do you fall? Because I look at my life and I'm like, oh God, my, my prayer life sort of shows my faith is like a two and a half, you know? But I, I pray some, some prayers, but man, if I really believe that there's a God who heard and listens and is active and moving in the world, I'm gonna pray some big, bold prayers. Let me give you three faith-filled facts. These are from Pastor Craig Groeschel. Uh, I, I, I completely ripped them off from him because they're, they're perfect and I couldn't make them better. I would have and then taken credit, but I couldn't. So three faith-filled facts. Number one, you cannot play it safe and please God. Did you know that? You can't play it safe and please God. There's no category of life where as a follower of Jesus, you just don't take any risks and you just don't step out of your comfort zone and you just play it real safe 
and God is like, sweet, that's what I created you for. No, God, he, he didn't create like the Ford uh, Taurus of a life. He made you like a Ferrari. Like you got to give it some gas. Come on, somebody. We, we rented a car this weekend. I'm, I'm going on a trip this week and I, I always rent a car because uh, we, we, we have two cars now, but one of them wouldn't make it to where I need to go. So we rented another one. And, uh, and so I always just feel like it's like so awesome when I have a brand new car like rented. You know, I only have it for a week, but come on, it's great, right? You, you're living the life. And man, it's got a little bit of get up and go. So I told the kids, I'm like, we're driving the red car today. Like, they're like, yeah. And they're like, dad, how fast are we going? I'm like, 63. Woo. You know, I don't want to break the law. Okay, so anyways, you cannot play it safe and please God. God, he gave you a Maserati engine. They gave you that life. And he wants you to use it in this way. It says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. So here's the thing. If you, if you can accomplish your goals without God, you're going to amaze him with your lack of faith. You can't play it safe and please God. Like you have to take some chances. Again, you're, you're embracing the gap in life. You're going, man, I'm going to try to do something that I couldn't do by myself and watch what God is doing. You know, part of life, the enjoyment of life, the celebration of life is to actually take some chances and get scared from time to time. Are you with me? Now, you guys have heard me say, like, I am not a daredevil. Um, my friends would be like, hey, let's go jump off bridges into rivers. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. That doesn't sound fun to me. Some people are like, the higher, the better. Not me. I, I like to play it safe, really, in, in most ways. But every once in a while in life, I'll kind of take a chance. Like, I went to Las Vegas with my family one year. And at the New York, New York Hotel, there's this roller coaster that goes around at the top, not the really tall stratosphere one. I'm not, I'm not crazy. But anyways, this one's like two or 300 feet up. And I went to the very front of the roller coaster and there's really no, uh, no front to it. I mean, it's just, you're kind of just basically hanging over the front. And, and it was amazing. Like it was so exciting and thrilling. And when I got off, I, I was alive. How many of you know what this feels like? When you do something that makes you feel alive. And here's the thing, there's a lot of Christians and even people who are sort of looking from the outside in at Christianity, they go, man, that's boring. And even a lot of Christians and followers of Jesus who are just bored, you're just kind of going through the motions. And the reason why is because you're not in a risk factor with God. Like you're not scared. You're not at a place where it's challenging you out of your comfort zone. You're not really living by faith. So if you're a bored Christian, what that means is you're probably just playing it safe, too safe, and really not living by faith. And you're like, yeah, but I'm afraid to fail. What if I start a joy group? What if, I, what if I start talking to my coworkers about my faith in Christ? What if I start to lead my family in a, in a God-honoring way? Like I'm scared of what might happen. Correct. And guess what? Everything might come crashing down, but you're not alive unless you're actually willing to take some chances. Like you're not pleasing God and living this life of faith that he's created you if you're not ever getting to this place where there's some risk. Now hear what I'm saying, not what I'm not saying. I'm not saying go take chances for chances sake. I'm saying when God is leading you forward, it should freak you out a little bit. I remember getting to uh, the, back in 2016 when we planted Joy Church and it was in our living room and there was 29 of us. And I'm just going to tell you, I was not full of faith. Oh, God is going to do amazing things. Like I was scared. I was scared. I thought, man, I hope that we get more people at this church because I like to eat food. Like, I want to have a job. How many of you know, like, a job is a good thing? Uh, you know, I sure hope that as a pastor, like, we get enough people here where we're not, like, nine people for nine years. You know what I mean? This is, like, the pastor's nightmares. You want to know what pastors dream about on Saturday night? Th like, this type of stuff. My dream is that I walk out on stage. I don't have notes. Nobody's here. You know, it's like those kind of nightmares, you know? I was nervous. I was afraid, but we were taking a risk because we were saying, God, we're making a gap. We won't believe in you're going to show up. You might fail. Uh, and, 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 and courage is not the absence of fear. It's what we do in spite of fear, right? Stepping forward. Faith is not the absence of the possibility of failure. It's, it's stepping forward. So look, if you're not failing or you're not even giving yourself an opportunity to fail, you're playing it too safe. Never let the fear of failure talk you out of an act of faith because you're going to be making decisions in the wrong way. Never let the fear of failure talk you out of an act of faith. Okay, number two, another faith-filled fact. As long as you have a guarantee, you don't have faith. Well, Pastor Jake, if I step out and do what God's calling me to do or what I think he might be calling me to do, is it gonna work out? I don't know. We don't have a guarantee for anything we do in life that matters. You with me? 
You know, the thing is, you, you, you could never lose a game if you don't play, but you also never win. When you step out on the field of life, there's no guarantee that you're going to get the victory or whatever, but you're also, there's, what you are guaranteed of is you'll never amount to anything if you don't step forward. Faith requires us to step into these zones and these places where there's no guarantee, but we're trusting and believing in God. It's like what we're doing as a church as we move forward into the next step of our journey, purchasing the Skate World property, is we're saying we don't have a guarantee that, we're, that, that it's going to all work out. We don't have a guarantee that all the money's going to come in exactly when it, when it needs to come in. What we do have uh, confidence in, though, is the, the heart of God and the mission of God and what he's called us to do. We're walking by faith, not by sight. If you want to be at a church that always works in guarantees, this is not the one for you because we're, we're wanting to be a church that says, God, we're going to go right to the, the bleeding edge of faith, trusting in God. And guess what? It's a whole lot of fun. It's more like a roller coaster than, than uh, bumper cars or something like that. It's a lot more fun. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Real faith says, I don't need a guarantee because I know who God is. And, I, and the invisible God that has shown up time and time again will make things visible. I'm, the things I'm hoping for, I'm walking in that assurance about things I cannot see because the God I cannot see has shown up and become visible in a lot of things in my life. There's confidence in the character of God. Hear, hear me on this. Why do I have confident faith? Because I have confidence in who God is. But there's no guarantee. And if you have a guarantee, you don't really have faith, right? It doesn't work that way. Here's the deal. There's a word for people who always need a guarantee. You want to know what it is? Coward. Cowards always need to be assured of victory or success before they ever take the battlefield. That, that is not how we're called to live in a life of faith. And, and here's the reality. You can have faith or you can have control, but you can't have both. And I want, to, I want to challenge you in life. Where are you really holding on to control, saying simultaneously, well, I really, I'm, I'm living a life of faith. Well, not really. You're actually living a life of control. And when you let go of control and allow God to lead you and guide you, even into things that kind of scare you, they don't have a guarantee, that's when you're really stepping out. And so, you know, we have to be aware of this, that when we are called of God and moving forward in life, and this can mean different things for different people, that there are times where it really might not work, but you've got to trust God and find out. And I'll say it this way. You've got to step out to find out. You've got to step out to find out. One of the things that is a huge piece of who we are at Joy Church is this on this, this banner here. It says, take the next step with Jesus. Here's what I know and believe and understand. Every one of us here is at a different place in our journey with God, right? Uh, what challenges you in your faith might not challenge me and, and vice versa. We're all at a different place. And it's not that we're all supposed to take the same step it's that we're all supposed to take the next step with Jesus. What is the next step for you? Maybe for you, it's about trusting God in the area of your finances and actually practicing biblical giving, biblical generosity, and leaving an American consumer mindset about finances, a control mindset, and embracing what God has for you in that area. Maybe for you, it's about embracing the teaching of the Bible about areas of morality in your life and, and leaning into what Christ uh, teaches and so on and so forth. Maybe for you, it's about moving into serving. I don't know. And I'm not here to tell you what your step is. What I'm here to tell you is there is one and you need to take it. And you're never going to see what God has for you until you step out. You won't find out until you step out. Come on. You got to step out to find out what God has for you. So stepping away from uh, this, the, the guarantee and all of that. And that leads us to our third point here. Number three, to step toward your destiny, you have to step away from your security. Come on. Everybody has a night night. Everybody has, has a blankie, right? And you hold on to it. I know we're talking about it earlier today that with kids, my kids, uh, we put them to bed every night and uh, they, they know there's this little, this little scam they pull where they leave their blankets downstairs, right? Because how could you sleep without your blanket? You know what I mean? Your blankie. So my daughter, Penny, is a master at this. She's, she's Machiavellian. It's incredible. Uh, she'll figure out a way to like place the blanket downstairs. And then we, we get her all the way put to bed. Stories have been told. Prayers have been prayed. Kisses have been given. Hugs have been given. There's been tickling. It's all happened. All of the, the whole thing. And it's in that moment when suddenly her light goes off and, oh, I don't have my blanket. I have to restart this entire process. I have to go downstairs. And then I'm thirsty and I'm hungry. I forgot to brush my teeth. Oh, I have to go to the bathroom. Two hours later, sometimes it works. Other times the blanket still gets, you guys understand what I'm talking about. 
And we all have the night-night. We all have the blankie. It's like you can't sleep without it. When I was a kid, I had a, a down feather pillow from my grandparents. They were kind of mad because it was like a $100 pillow that I had locked onto. Like I had champagne wishes and caviar dreams even as a young child. <laughs> and I had this, uh, <laughs> I had the, the down feather pillow. That was my, my pillow was my security blanket, right? All of us kind of have this thing, but the reality is to recognize, to realize what God has for us in the area of our destiny, we've got to be willing to step away from what keeps us safe, step away from our security. It says in the book of Hebrews 11, verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Okay, ponder this and grow wise. Like, lean into this verse. I would encourage you to look at this verse, consider the story of Abraham. Abraham is living in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, right? And Abraham, he's not even named Abraham there. His name is Abram. God changes his name later. But anyways, God comes to Abram. He says, Abram, go, go, move, move away. Go somewhere. I'm, call, I'm calling you to go somewhere. He doesn't tell him where. He doesn't tell him uh, what's up. Like he doesn't give him step three, step four, step five. He just gives him step one. And it says, by faith, Abraham activates. He, he gets up, he, he goes, and he goes to a place that, that later, so looking back later, we know he gets it as his inheritance. How many of you, if, if God came to you and said, I want you to, to start a joy group because in the next two years, 5,000 people will end up being impacted by what you do in your group, uh, you'll also be a multimillionaire, and you will lose 20 pounds and look amazing. Um, how many of you be like, sure? right? Uh, if you will serve in the nursery, you will actually end up impacting a young uh, child who will grow up to be the greatest revivalist the world has ever seen and will lead millions of people to Jesus. And then you go, well, yeah, I guess if you put it like that, then sure, I'll go. Because if our destiny, if we knew it, then sometimes it would be easy, but again, it doesn't come with a guarantee, right? God tells Abraham, I want you to go to this place, doesn't know, later he's going to receive this entire land as his inheritance he gets up and he goes, even though he didn't know where he was going. To step toward your destiny, you've got to step away from your security. But God requires that we step away from our security first. And I wish it wasn't this way. Don't you? Don't you wish you could straddle security, faith, and then really gingerly have the rope over here and then kind of, you know what I mean? And then, okay, we did it. But that's not how it works. The, the grace activated pressure, the, 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 the gap, when, when Jesus calls Peter to step out of the boat, it's like that space between, there's a point at which you're committed and you're over the boat and your foot hits the water. It's in those moments that miracles take place. To activate or step toward your destiny, you've got to step away from your security. So what does that look like in your life? I want to challenge us here that we limit God with our unbelief and our lack of faith by playing it safe and never giving God an opportunity to activate into God mode and do things that blow our minds. And I just want to challenge us as a church for just a, just a minute or two here that we have, have, we started with 29 people. We started with no money. We started with butt ugly, uncomfortable chairs in a living room in South Eugene. And now there's about five or 600, maybe more that come to Joy Church. Um, God has blessed our finances like 10, 100 times what, I don't know what we even, we had nothing. So yeah, it was like infinite more. Um, we just bought a building, uh, as you know, Skate World, which is exciting. We're remodeling it. Um, God has done so many things. And you know what I feel like in my spirit? We're not even, we're not even in the introduction phase. Because I look at our city and I'm thinking, Jake, you're not thinking big enough not about growth, not about bigger buildings. I'm thinking about people's lives. The very first message that we preached, that we talked about at Joy Church was about the city of Nineveh. God said to Jonah, Jonah, don't you care? There's 220,000 people and a bunch of animals. You don't even give a, a rat's rear end about them. You're just mad about how, your comfort. But, but God's heart was for the city. God's heart is always for the city. God's heart is still for this city. People, people go, man, that's so cool. You guys are gonna have a home. You're going to Skate World. And I'm like, well, I get a little hesitant because our church has never been about possessing or occupying a building. That is not a destination. It is a step on a journey. There is no building large enough to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in this city. There is not, we have not, we have not seen the realization of the harvest of what God is calling us to do as a church 
you have not seen the realization of the harvest of what God is calling you to do in your life, you are still just getting the seeds ready to plant. Come on. And yet what we do is we limit God. We go, oh, if our church, if we could just get a building, then that would be it. That's the destination. Wrong. If we could just, you know, become a church of a thousand, that's it. Wrong. Until we get to the place where every person in this, this wonderful, beautiful city and this community has heard the gospel of Jesus and has either responded with a resounding yes or a resounding no. We're not done. And we're not thinking big enough. Come on. And let me just tell you right now, in every area, I'm not challenging you to give more money or to pray bigger prayers or whatever. I just want you to lean in and say, God, blow my mind. I want to amaze you with faith in a God who is bigger than what I've put you in these little boxes of what's possible and what I can do. Come on. God wants to un activate and unleash you in your faith to be those big thinking, bet the farm, risk taking, not insulting God with safe living. Come on. That's who God has called us to be. And if you can just get a tiny bit of that today, that God has so much for each person in this place individually and so much for us as a family and as a church. Come on, it's a fun journey. I'm excited. You want to go on it with me? Let's do it. The only requirement is that occasionally I get a steak and some coffee and then I'm in. And if the Ducks win a national championship, I'm a man of simple needs. That's all, that's all I care. I believe the Holy Spirit is stirring in some people's hearts today awakening dreams that you put to bed, put to sleep, that you need to wake up again. I believe the Holy Spirit is, is activating some, some bigger thinking. Just even in the area of finances, you've been limited. My, my parents were poor. My grandparents were poor. I'm going to be poor. No, God has more for you in that area. Uh, I, I, you know, my, my parents' marriage failed. My grandparents' marriage failed. Therefore, my marriage, no, no. Come on. God is big. Believe God. Have faith. Amaze Jesus with big faith and believe God that he has more for you. Come on. Maybe today some, you're being challenged because you know there's an area of sacrifice, whether that's financially, whether it's serving, whether it's going to your coworkers and sharing the gospel, whatever it is, but you feel the Holy Spirit pressure and you're like, oh, it's too much for me. It's too scary. I'm scared. That's okay. It's going to be so fun when God parts the Red Sea and you walk across on dry ground. It's going to be so fun when you look back and you get to tell a testimony. Testimonies are terrible if there was no, no risk. Remember that one time when nothing interesting happened? Yeah, neither do I. But I remember for us at Joy Church when we started with no money, really no people, no plan, and yet here we are because of the faithfulness of God, step by step by step. I remember the story where we bought this building that we can't afford and we try to move to it and like we don't know the end of the story yet, but it's exciting. My goodness, it's exciting because faith is fun. Come on, faith is exciting. So let's be people of big faith believing in God. God's putting something in your spirit today. Activate it. Let it become something that, that, that really, uh, a seed that germinates and grows into a beautiful thing in your life. Amen? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Hey, if you're here today, you're like, Pastor Jake, this is cool. I like this faith stuff. This is interesting. Uh, but I'm not a follower of Jesus yet. Like I, I have not put my faith in Christ. Really before you can activate this God kind of faith and activate big faith and get breakthrough in life and do the stuff we're talking about, it starts with a very simple act of faith, which is to begin to trust in Jesus. Not your, your own goodness, not your own performance in life. That doesn't earn your way to God. And conversely, neither does your failure disqualify you from God. The, the message of the gospel simply is this, God paid your bill through Jesus who died on the cross for your sin and he wants to have fellowship, relationship, with you. And it's going to, he's asking you for something pretty big. He's asking you for your whole life. But the exchange, so wonderful that he will give you his son, the life of his son, the righteousness of his son. If that's you today and you're like, Pastor Jake, I want to put my faith in Jesus. Would you just lift up your hand so I can see? Just put it up. Thank you. Thank you. All over this place. Awesome. Anybody else? I want to put my faith in Christ for real. Not fake. Just not religious. I just, I want Jesus. I want to walk with God. Awesome. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I put my faith and trust in you and in you alone. I thank you for saving my life and making me right with God. Thank you for taking my sin and paying for it. I commit it to you and I receive your grace and I receive your forgiveness. 
Give me the grace to walk with you every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.